I'm going to talk to you now about the other kind of memory in the brain, and that is short-term memory. Previously, I talked to you about long-term memory, and now short-term memory. Short-term memory, as the name implies, is memory that does not hold information for the same amount of time or the same duration. So when you think about what you go through immediately in the time immediately preceding a test, like the night before or maybe the morning of or after you come into the room and you sit down before the instructor says put away your books and notes and get ready to take the test. You are saying things over and over yourself trying to get information into short-term memory. You will not have to keep it there very long because as soon as you start taking the test you may write it down on a piece of paper or you may start using it to answer the questions and very shortly afterward that information will disappear. But while it's in short-term memory, it's easily accessible to you. It's not like long-term memory where information can stay for a long period of time but may be particularly hard to find. Uh, it would be like, for example, um, leaving your baseball glove or your tennis racket on the kitchen table. You would always know where to find it, assuming somebody didn't move it from there. Uh, as opposed to storing it somewhere in your attic, which is more like long-term memory, and you might never find it again after you did that. So the processes, the mechanisms for getting information and keeping information in short-term memory may, are going to be somewhat, in some ways, similar to long-term memory, but not exactly the same. So I'm going to go through some of those and describe them to you. The first procedure for getting and keeping information in short-term memory, and by far the most important and useful, is practice. They say practice makes perfect. Well, it may not make perfect, but it certainly, as long as you keep practicing something, it still will stay in short-term memory. Um, the word we use, the technical word we use for this process is called rehearsal. It's like when actors and actresses for a stage play go over the lines, but when you go over the formulas, or the dates, or the names, or the facts that you're trying to remember. You say them over and over to yourself, you're practicing. The more you practice, the more likely they are to remain in short-term memory, at least for a short period of time. There are two ways that you can practice. One way that you can practice is called massed practice. And massed practice means that it's all massed together. And in, we have a word for that, not a psychology word, but a, a school word, and that's called cramming. And that's when you wait until the night before a test and you try to get everything into short-term memory. And that does not work very well because short-term memory will not hold an awful lot of information that's put in in a short period of time. So the better form of practice is called distributed practice, and that's where you do a little bit at a time and you keep practicing it, and it's more likely to get information into short-term memory. The, um, the second factor, the important factor, is called meaningfulness. And that has to do with the meaning that the information has to you. The more meaningful information is to you, the easier it is to remember. The less meaningful, the harder it is to remember. Very hard to remember your license plate very often because it has three letters. And the three letters don't make a word, not only that, you can't even pronounce the three letters, unless, of course, you pay some extra money and you get a vanity plate, and then you can generally pronounce it and remember it, but so can the police. So that may not be advantageous, but that, that's an indication of how much easier it is to remember things that are meaningful. So hopefully the things that you're trying to remember in school are meaningful, but if you find yourself having a lot of trouble remembering them, it may be because they have relatively little meaning to you. You know, foreign language, for example, that may be a problem. The third factor is called sequence, and that depends on where in the order of presentation the information is. If you go to a, into a social situation and you are introduced to five people the, who you never met before and you're told their names, the chances are that you will remember the names of two of the five people. You remember the name of the person you were introduced to first and the person you were introduced to last. That's called primacy and recency. Primacy, what comes first? There's nothing before it to get in its way. 
recency, what comes last. There's nothing after it to get in its way. But for the other three people, uh, hopefully one of them you're not particularly interested in because then you're going to have a lot more trouble remembering those names. So uh, they also say when you go for a job interview, try to be the first one or the last one so you can take advantage of those too because if you're in the middle, nobody may remember who you were. Um, the fourth one in the list, the fourth important procedure in the list is called organization. Now we had organizing as one of the long-term memory factors. We now have it again as one of the short-term memory factors. But for short-term memory, organizing takes a very interesting form that's called chunking. Chunking means putting together information into chunks. So if you have to remember a lot of information, if there's some way you can combine pieces of information into chunks, then you can make it a lot easier to remember. Uh, somebody was trained to remember 80 numbers. Now, 80 numbers is a lot of numbers to remember, uh, more so more numbers than people can typically remember. And this person was trained to do it by using a combination of practice and also chunking the numbers into groups of four. This person happened to be a runner, and he grouped the numbers into running times so that he could get four numbers together. So instead of having to remember 80 numbers, in effect, he was only having to remember 20 numbers. So if you can combine things together in order to get them into short-term memory, it'll be easier to do that. The fifth factor is called interference. When you're trying to remember something and you receive new information, you hear new information that gets into your receptors and into your sensory register, when it comes into your short-term memory, it gets all mixed up with what you're trying to remember. Just think if you're trying to remember somebody's telephone number and one of your friends who wants to make your life difficult starts repeating numbers over and over again. Uh, or else if you're doing an exercise in front of the TV, for example, and you're counting repetitions and all of a sudden somebody on the TV starts saying numbers, you lose where you were in your sequence because of interference. New inter information interferes with old information. Now sometimes it works the other way. Sometimes if you're learning something that you've already learned, a lot about before, when you're learning the new information, the old learning helps you to remember it. That's not called inf interference, that's called transfer. So when you go into take Spanish 2, for example, you start hearing words that you've already learned in Spanish 1, it makes it easier to remember them if they're similar to those words because of the fact that you have transfer, and that's another factor. So you have interference, which is bad, and transfer, which is good. And finally, the last of the factors is, is a very unusual word, one that you may never have heard before and probably would not be able to dispel just based on my saying it. And that word is mnemonics. That's a Greek word. And believe it or not, it starts with the letter M, but you don't hear the letter M. You just hear the second letter in the word, which is mnemonics. It's, in a lot of ways, it's like the word psychology. The word psychology begins with a P but you don't hear the P, you hear the second letter in the word, which is an S. So the word mnemonics, and mnemonics are memory tricks. And w very often they're done by using the first letters of words. Like for example, we remember the notes of the scale E, G, B, D, F by remembering every good boy does fine. And we learn that, and then we, when we want to try to remember the notes of the scale, we just need to think of every good boy does fine or else we can remember the colors of the spectrum by remembering Roy G. Biv, and that's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. When I was an undergraduate student, I took a course in comparative anatomy, and they taught us a mnemonic for remembering the 13 cranial nerves in the order in which they were numbered, and it was on old Olympus towering top, a Finn and German view to hop. Now I remember that, it's been quite a long time since I took comparative anatomy, and I remember the mnemonic, but I can't say for sure that I remember all the cranial nerves even though I have the first letters. So what's, what happens to a lot of mnemonics is they end up getting into long-term memory and they stay around and you remember them all your life, but initially you use them to get information into short-term memory. So just keep all these things in mind, practice, meaningfulness, sequence, organization, interference, transfer, and mnemonics. And the next time you have to study for a test, try applying all of these techniques to get information into short-term memory.